Hello and welcome to Vintage Alternative. I'm Ryan Hamilton and oh man, I could not be more excited to share this conversation today. It's with Lisa Umbarger from the Toadies, but not just Lisa from the Toadies. Lisa, my favorite member from one of my all-time favorite bands, the Toadies. We talk about this album, of course, We also talk about this album, and we talk about what happened in between these two. For all my fellow Toadies fans, there are a lot of questions. What happened in between and afterwards? We talk about it all. She could not have been cooler. I'm honored to call her a friend and super thankful that she took the time to hang out and talk to me about some difficult times and some pretty serious stuff, but also some really great memories and some really fun times. This is a really interesting, really funny conversation. I think you guys are going to love this. Here's my chat with Lisa Umbarger from the Toadies. I'd like to do kind of a reverse show and tell to start, if that's okay with you, where I'll show you something and you just tell me kind of what comes to mind when you see it. Okay. Number one, this guy right here from 1993 when you see this, what mm-hmm. comes to mind? What feelings surface? <laughs> well, well, first of all, <laughs> um, the artwork uh, is hilarious because the band was at odds about it. So the background, this is really funny. The background um, behind the Minotaur mm-hmm. is pubic hair that's from <laughs> <laughs> from like Amazing. a playboy magazine that's been oh, like over pixelated oh, so wow. that's a joke about it because we wanted the whole cover to be pubic hair that's um, amazing <laughs> and the record company was like eh, and it doesn't look good and you have to credit the artist so we just blew it up where you can't tell it's pubic hair and then that minotaur thing daryl um discovered it and yeah the back's pubic hair too by the way oh my god that's amazing. I knew this was going to be fun. It's already off to a much better start than I had even hoped. <laughs> I I love that that was even a conversation. It's like this pubic hair conversation was even a thing. Right. It just, With I'd, brass records. So we like, sent, they're like, what do you want on it? We just like sent a big pubic hair. And they're like, oh, oh I don't know about that. <laughs> okay. So this has early versions of uh, songs that would go on to be on the next album, which I'm going to show you in a second. So yeah, recorded in Dallas um, at uh, uh, Crystal Clear Studios, which was the best studio to be at. Mm. Keith Rust at the helm. Um, it was good, good fun recording that. Yeah. Um, and I was, uh, was going to ask. Was, yeah, it was Grass Records, which mm. was every other record label turned us down. Grass Records, uh, Dutch East India, uh, decided they would make a special label just for us because they couldn't figure out where we fit. Wow. And they made grass records. That's amazing. And were you guys sending cassette tapes at the time? Were you making your own cassettes? Was it a four yes. track? Like what What were you guys recording it yourselves? You were rehearsing in a um, storage unit, we, right? We did some record ourselves, but it didn't sound very good. Hmm. So we go into, you know, scrap up a little bit of money get like 200 bucks and go into a studio eight track uh, recording. And um, we did some demos also at crystal clear, um, which is, ex- was expensive for us right. back then um, right. as, you know, college students. But um, that uh, the story behind the, re- where we got the money for that recording, cause it sounds good. Mm. Um, there was a Christmas party that crystal clear went through and um they had a box in the back of the club that said, fill out this little, fill out this form and win some recording time, $500 worth of recording time. So it was free drinks and food. So everyone was at the bar. So while everyone was at the bar, I sat in the back and I filled the box full of, <laughs> of toadies, like us, put oh, our names in amazing. and we won. Oh man. And that was that. We had 500 bucks to go in and record and that was that. Amazing. Oh my god. So smart too. Just like, <laughs> yeah, let me get back here. Let me figure out the right. hustle. How do we right. do it? Everyone it. else was getting drinks and I was back there going, <laughs> "Yeah, when this 
uh, so you guys go from that. We're going to fast forward a little bit. This is actually mine. I got this first in 1994. This is my yeah. copy. So yeah. if you remember back in the day, we'd go to the record store. You would go, you would want to get the CD, but if they were sold out, you had to go back over to the cassette section and get, get it on cassette. So that's what I had to do. Cause I couldn't get rubberneck. Oh, at wow. first. It was, everybody was buying it. So I had a cassette copy eventually got the CD. But um, from here to here, whenever you think about this, what what comes to mind? What feelings oh, surface man. for you? Um, it's like a different band. Because, mm. um, you know, it's a, it's a totally different lineup for the Rubberneck. Charles left um, a few months before we got signed to do Rubberneck. And I always hated that, that mm. he put in all the work and then he wasn't there for the the payoff. Um, so it was a, it was a different band. It was a little sounded just a little bit different. Uh, Daryl did a great job of, of, uh, capturing Charles's tones. He developed, uh, Daryl's an amazing guitar player on his own. And, um, so it was different. It was, uh, creating rubberneck. We were really, really confident going into the studio and, um, they made us break down every single song and change it. Um, mm. you know, so we had to analyze every single song and take it apart and look at it under a microscope. So it was pre-production was, I think, two weeks of just dissecting the songs. Wow. And we ended up putting them right back together like they were right. in the end. And so like at the end, we were like mad, a little bit mad. Right. And then we were a little bit like, holy fuck, we actually know what we're doing. Yeah. So by the time we recorded it, we were ready and it was, it, I mean, it didn't take very long at all. Right. Um, it was recorded like an ACDC album. We wanted it to sound live. Um, and it kind of was because when we recorded the drums and the bass, we recorded it with the full band in the studio playing. And uh, very cool. And I think it captures that live kind of feeling because of that. Abs- absolutely. And, the balls to start it with an instrumental. I'm sure you had to fight with the record label about this because just being there myself and being put through the machine like that. What was yeah. that like going, okay, it's our debut. We're, we're <laughs> really excited. Here's track one instrumental. Right. Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> that's really funny. Cause we, that was the only song we wrote uh, specifically for the album. When we wrote going into, we wrote that in the studio. Hmm. And it's kind of like uh, uh, just tipping our hat to Reverend Horton Heat. Oh, cool. Because it's got right. a Horton Heat kind of feel. We we yeah. really love Horton Heat. And it's kind of, um, I don't know if anyone's ever said that out in public. But yeah, that was our yeah. homage to Reverend Horton Heat. And it's named Mexican Hairless because we were drinking um, ch- uh, Chihuahua beer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in the Fancy. studio. That's the that's the beer that we had the whole time and we had cases and cases and cases of Chihuahua beer and we named it after the beer. Cause we would sit and drink. And then we were like, what about this? And we wrote that. That's yeah. great. And then the, <laughs> so the record label, when you turned that in, did they fight you on that track one yeah. instrumental? Do you remember? You know, I can't remember cause we had so yeah. many fights with the record <laughs> label about Fair. that. Yeah. I bet. Um, uh, Cause the first fight was we didn't want to put possum kingdom on it. We did not re- originally record possum kingdom. Um, and they made us and, uh, and then after we went back, we thought we were all done. We went and recorded two more songs in LA. And I think those were quitter and Mr. Love. Cause I think we were okay. leaving those off as well. Um, Cause we're like, nope, we're done. And they're like, nope, we we wanted those other songs too. And sh- shit. So we yeah. went to Sunset Studios and recorded those two songs in a day, wow. I think, when we got back. Um, and so you, put, put those on the record. So you guys kind of went in mad. Oh, There's yeah. a, a level of just like, God, like what? Yeah. But What did we sign up for? Uh, Fuck this. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm sure, and I want to talk a little bit about when all of this was happening as far as the 90s. But at the same time, there was, I'm sure, like 
we're going to do it. We hate that we have to do it this way, but we're going to do it. Like, you know, what was yeah. that struggle like for you guys? The, I guess we'll do this even though we're mad. Well, um, I think the the thing that helped us the most were the other artists that were on Interscope at the time. Mm. Cause there was drive like Jehu. Um, mm. there, uh, you know, we were looking at all the other bands that were on the label that that totally were not your stuff you would hear on the radio. Right. Because we weren't looking for radio play necessarily. We were looking to be like Rocket from the Crypt, who I fucking love. And that I think <laughs> that was the that was the final um in my mind, that was the final thing that that made me want to pick Interscope because Rocket from the Crypt and Drive Like Jehu. Or on the mm. label, and I was like, "Well, shit, we can't go wrong with these guys on the label." Love that, um, because you know they they also had the they didn't have Bush or No Doubt yet, but they also they had Gerardo, mm. and they had um, uh, oh god, they had they had some shit too, right? So, <laughs> but and I, I won't name bands, right? But, um, <laughs> but we, you know, it was it was basically Rocket from the Crypt for me that was like, okay, I'm gonna I want this label. Right. And it, we didn't even talk to any other labels after that. Um, they called us, but we didn't even return their phone calls because we're like, no, this is who we're p- going with. So because we made that decision so uh, passionately, we were trusting the process. Right. That's but we, fair. It doesn't mean that we're not going to be little punk ass bitches and fight <laughs> right. a little bit about <laughs> it, you know? <laughs> well, speaking of that, I grew up just outside of Fort Worth, near where all of you guys are from. And Mm -hmm. it was really cool as a teenager to watch this band that we were all rooting for do it. And you're on the radio and then you're on MTV. Wanted to ask you about this for a really long time because I love this. When you you guys would, and it was mostly you who would, I was just like, I wanted to stand up and clap at the TV whenever you would do this. On MTV or VH1, they would always try and ask you about the dark subject matter and all of like, you know what I mean? And you would always have a tongue in cheek. Like they couldn't quite tell if you were joking, but we're in Texas just like, yes, Lisa, go Lisa. (laughs) Is that something that you either one hated doing or two just enjoyed kind of messing with them because they were kind of trying to take it in a weird dark like what's this religious you know <laughs> so you nailed it. it it was always um todd and i especially when we got together it was our one and only goal is to fuck with them yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh <sighs> and we heard uh, todd and i when we worked at the record store we saw um a band bio by Jane's Addiction. Mm. And Perry Farrell said, never, ever, ever, ever tell the truth. Ever. Amazing. And and, um, so we're like, man, if we just spin yarns, it might be fun. And um, so that's mostly what we did. So we were doing everything for our own amusement. Yeah. And our buddies back home that were entertaining like you, I guess. Yeah. We were loving it. I mean, I was... (laughs) God, I was in middle school and high school whenever yeah. you guys were doing your thing. So it was so, so it was when MTV was still MTV and, you know, Beavis yeah. and Butthead and all of that stuff was happening. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we loved it. Please know that there and I'm sure I'm one of many that were just like, yes, so good because everybody was kissing the ass of the music business. And, yeah. you know, you guys seem to have this thing where you almost and correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't think it was going to last. Like it was just like, nah, we're going to, is that right? Would you, is that fair to say? Yeah. Like the whole time we're like, um, if we get beer, beer and pizza money, we're good. Yeah. Um, So, and we were on the road touring and working hard and all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, a lot more people are coming to the shows. So it was kind of like what's happening kind of thing. And um, in fact, you know, we had sold, God, how, yeah, our record went gold and we were still driving our van. We didn't even wow. get have a tour bus yet. And because or crew, we were still like setting up our own stuff on these big stages. And um, we didn't have crew. We didn't have anyone with us. We we're driving ourselves in a van. And finally, our record company, I, our, I remember our A&R guy came out and is like, um, you guys are making the people sad. And we're like, what are you talking about? Why? 
yeah, we're like, what do you, what do you mean? And he's like, the kids don't want to see you guys setting up your own gear. Oh. We're like, well, we're blue collar, hardworking musicians. What's wrong with that? And they're like, you're making the kids sad. Weird. They're writing into us. They want to know why you guys are having to drive yourself in a van. Interesting. And set your own gear up. So we're like, okay. And, they, and then he was like, so I brought crew and he brought a guy that was going to set up our gear. But it didn't work out because it was one of his buddies. Um, uh, but uh, to go out with Bush the second time, which it's well documented that we did not get along with them. Right. We right. told them, get us a tour bus then and get us crew. Yeah. And, um, and we did. I, I take that back. We did have a sound man. Um, by the time the album went gold, we had a really good sound man who could blow everyone else off the stage because he was yeah. so good and made us sound so good. I remember um, I was coming to see you guys then and I saw you at Will Rogers with Brutal Juice. Yes. And I remember I remember you guys coming on and you didn't even say anything and it was like four or five songs just ba 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 ba. And I remember me and my friends just like this is the greatest night of my life. <laughs> you know, just that thing. Yeah. And then you finally said something but by that time sonically we had just been like destroyed <laughs> in the best possible way. And I will never forget that. Just so it's interesting to me to hear you talk about your sound guy and how dialed in he had it. So that's that's pretty. Yeah, amazing. he was the sound guy for Guns N' Roses when they were doing the oh, big wow. stadium tour. So he totally we were green. We didn't know what the fuck we were doing. Mm. And he knew what he was doing. So we trusted him. And we always wanted to just walk up there and just play and not say anything. We're awkward anyway. Mm. Um, talking in front of people so we're like let's just go and play and then yeah. well, at least somewhere we'll say hi and then right. go back into the set right what hey what was your favorite song to play back then from i burn, burn. I it burn. was really yeah still is still is i yeah. freaking love that song um the, it's just the a vibe grinding. yeah yeah that song would fill up an entire room with just like this feeling like just this ominous just like everyone just kind of stood still after really going for it for however long yeah so that's really cool that that's I, that's the last song i thought you would say if i'm being honest i thought you i like backslider say. and yeah and, uh, i get it those though. too but man yeah. end with because we ended with i burned because it was just like and here's here's all we got right here and we put all yeah. of that into that song and it's simple it's a simple Amazing. song super easy but it's just like we can put everything into it. And then it's just like, drop the guitar. We're out. That right. was it. Amazing. I want to ask you, God, I could talk to you forever about rubberneck, but I'm going to go here. We don't have to spend yeah. a long time on it if you don't want to, but I love this record. Whenever you see too. that. Okay, good. Because little sin push the hand. I could, I'll, yeah. I'll save you the list. Those should have been massive. So yeah, when you see this, what do you, feel you know what comes to there's mind. uh there's a lot of sadness with that record mm -hmm. um I, first of all i love the the uh cover uh i had this coffee table book by f stop fitzgerald yeah uh, the photographer yeah and we got special permission to use his photograph for that that's a stained glass window i think in like oh gosh maybe poland this way yeah I it's an it. archangel and it was originally a stained glass i freaking love that picture uh yeah to um but uh I did not know that. So that yeah. that that ties in this as well because this was in Dallas. Yeah, that's just yeah. another stained glass. We always said yeah. that was our favorite stained glass. So um, you know, it ties back into the religious stuff because we all have religious backgrounds, but it's not right. you know, we're not religious, but you know, it's back to our roots kind of thing. Right. But um that album, uh we recorded an album in between rubberneck and that one. Um I don't know if I, it, if I should ask you about that one or not. With with Paul Leary from the Bubble Surfers and mm. the record company hated it. Mm. And um, they said, uh, and this is a quote, just go into the studio, go back in the studio, rewrite everything and give me three songs. And I don't care if you fart on the rest. That was a quote. Good give me God. Three songs. So that's where Best of Three came from, that song Best of Three. Okay. Um. So that's the, but that's our, you know, kind of us giving a finger. But um, right. that album, 
again, we were mad at the record company because they didn't like mm. the the one that we came up with uh, that was hit a lot harder, I think. Was paper, was paper Dress going to go on that one? On after, No, after Paper Robert? Dress was recorded specifically to be a um, soundtrack. It was. A one-off soundtrack okay. thing. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and I can't remember if the contract said that. It, 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 there might have been some stipulations in the contract for that as yeah. well. But we never intended to put that on a record okay. um, that we always, released. I always wondered um, sonic, sonically, because you just mentioned it hitting harder. Yeah, if that was like okay, they're gonna go here. This is paper dress is kind of where they're at now. Yeah, I always I always wonder. So, um, anyway, so so uh, hell below stars above. You know, we were all pretty much in a happy place, even with the record company stuff going on. We were we we're all in a place in our lives where we were settling down. Mm. Uh, we were getting married, um, and things were were nice so this album i you know like that song mine it's got mm. more it's got more of that it reflects some of that and um yeah we were, we were just pretty much in a pretty satisfied place when we made that right. or when we wrote it but when we made it it was not it was not that because it was harder we were still battling with the record company right and the record company hated us we made the cut that was the time when record companies were cutting all the bands right. reverend horton heat got cut from interscope wow um in fact most of the bands that we loved got cut from interscope um and you know it was a deep deep cut and um uh we survived it and we're like okay well maybe they still believe in us because we were waiting for them to cut us too yeah. and um and we're like, okay, so maybe they're, they believe in us again, but we recorded the record and we saw that the record company was not going to support it at all. Even though they made us go back and record the record that they wanted, yeah. um, we were not going to get any support. And they told us, they're like, you guys are asses. You won't do what we tell you. And let's go see you make it on your own kids. Wow. And that was that record. So that record's got a lot of emotional stuff tied up right. into it. I saw you guys perform. I, I went to uh, South Padre for spring break and you guys played a show. I was in college, I think. And it was when all of this was going on. And yeah. I remember, even though that was that's a different conversation, that was one of the wildest nights of my life. But <laughs> good. <laughs> yeah. You guys were angry like it was i remember feeling that from the stage and there's already an element of that you know when it comes to toadies and playing yeah. live and you guys had that already but i remember it being like turned up a little bit and me and my friends leaving going i don't think everything's okay there even yeah. though we loved it i mean we had the time of our lives but yeah. it was definitely a little extra and yeah you guys felt that i'm sure on stage was that a good thing or did it make it less enjoyable to perform during that time? It was real. We still like performing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it, you know, you're playing with your family. So right. we all like going up there, but the stuff behind the scenes was hard. It was mm -hmm. really hard and it was taking its toll on us a lot. Um, and we changed guitar players. Um, so Clark Vogler's in the band at this time. Mm. And, um, and that was hard. It was, uh, there was just, there was a lot of changes and um, we didn't know what the record industry was going to look like right. this too, because it was unknown territory. Right. Everything was changing. Everything was starting to go to streaming yeah. and terrible. Uh, we were uncomfortable. We we're, we're totally uncomfortable with everything Yeah, on that record. I want to ask you, and again, just being conscious of the time, um, you talk about the record business and all the changes that were happening. It's that, that was the beginning of the sea change, the Napster, digital music, all of that. Yeah. Do you feel lucky to have come up in the 90s pre-internet, or do you feel <clears throat> you're kind of answering? I, I yeah. feel, you do feel like, I think that's going to be looking oh, back. Oh, man, yes. Right? Well, first of all, we're... I, I don't want to speak for the other members of the band, but I was, I did some dumbass stuff too. Right. Um, and thank God I did not have a platform to put all that stupid. <laughs> Great stuff point. Out. Didn't even think oh, about it. Yeah. 
fuck. Um, so yeah. that alone, although right now, you know, the um, it's interesting for me because my college background's in marketing. Mm. So it's interesting to me about how the landscape's changed. Mm. Um, I don't like it the way it works as much because before, you know, you get the big signing bonus and you go into the system and you don't have to do as much work, even mm. though they take more money. You can kind of sit back and drink beer and play and not have to worry about the business of it as much. Yeah. And now I think musicians have to be business people more. That's more very so. well said and very true. I will say, though, and this just dawned on me, you would have probably been my favorite person on Twitter in 1995. <laughs> you would have had some hilarious shit to say, I'm sure. And that would have been actually really entertaining. But at least I, I got to see... <laughs> There would have probably been a video <laughs> documentary of it all. I can't remember half of it. I did keep a journal because one of my friends was like, please write this down so you can mm. remember it. Mm. And I was like, fuck this. And I maybe yeah. wrote down some stuff. I went back and read some of it. And I was like, wow, I need to write a book. You do need to write a book. It was, it was crazy. Yeah. So, Well, I want to ask you about, speaking of what you're doing now, um, your podcast, Jackalope Tales, and anything else you yeah. want to talk about. But you know I love your podcast. Tell me and the people that are going to watch and listen to this, which is going to be a large UK audience, who I've been right. playing your, mu your music for for the first time on, I got a gig on a big radio station over there. So a lot of people are discovering you guys these are, I only play music from these records. No offense to anybody else, but these this is the music that I play. Um, Thank you. Of course, and they love it. So if yeah, and they're just like, "What? What is this? Oh my god!" It's like, yeah, UK, welcome yes. to the party. Thirty years later, thank yep. you for coming. Anyway, Jackalope Tales for these people who don't know, please tell them it's my favorite podcast. <laughs> so I, I'm excited for you to tell them what it is. So. Um... Back to, you know, where we started, where we like to tell tales. Um, we realized that everywhere we went, people were like, oh, tell us some stories, tell us some stories. So Charles and I would tell these stories. Like even in our band's rehearsal, um, Soul Shifter, they're like, tell us stories about the traveling days. And we would tell these stories. And Charles and I were like, man, we need we need a place to put these stories. And. And I was like, yeah, I think we're selling it short. And after a few times going back and forth, we we're like, what if we tell all the stories of music, like the crazy ass stories that some are true, some are not. And we decided instead of calling it, really, it's not an urban legend. It's a jackalope tale because a jackalope mm. tale doesn't, a jackalope doesn't exist. Although a lot of people think it does kind of like a chupacabra or whatever. <laughs> um, so, Snipe hunting. Uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. So we're like, it, it'll be really Texas. Uh, it'll be juicy Texas flavor if we call it Jackalope Tales. It, you know, again, it's hearkening back to our roots, and um, we tell crazy stories about musicians, and it's all music um, stories about. Some are really cool and and happy, and wow, that's really cool. And others are dark and. Mm. scary which we like obviously listen to the toadies right. music and we like dark and um some stuff you and, and what we're trying to do is though the internet is a fucked up place to get information from mm. don't do it yeah and it's funny and we like to laugh at it and make jokes about it and um and that's mostly what we do but mostly it's just so charles and i can hang out and tell stories to each other and try and make each other laugh it is so good, Lisa. I love it so much. And the reacts videos, all of it is really working. And it's good to see it really kind of gaining, I'm sure you feel this too, some momentum recently. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I just, I'm so excited for you guys and just thrilled to be able to talk to you today and do this. And Well, I appreciate you. Of course. She is just the best. I am so thankful for the opportunity to get to ask those questions and have that talk. It could have gone a lot of different ways because, I mean, the band went through a lot in the 90s. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Thanks for watching. Thanks again to Lisa. And if you enjoyed this, take a look around. There's a lot of fun stuff on this channel. I'm Ryan. This is Vintage Alternative. And I'll see you next time.